must not go commit to stakeholders to what can be delivered. Just one question there, right? Provide all progress reporting. Like, what would that entail? Like, is that velocity, the, burn down, whatever the whatever the needs of the organization are? We'll go through some of those controls tomorrow with the options are. But if this dashboard or any sort of visible reporting that needs to be created ultimately the scrum master is responsible for creating that. As a leader, the scrum master needs to understand the team members' needs. You know, they all kind of chuckled when I told them last week, I said, you've got to learn those soft skills that you've been putting off learning for 20 years. You know, as a scrum master, you have those management skills that we aren't always measured on, those are the ones that need to be the forefront of your scrum master. You have to understand the project's requirements, Act for the welfare of both the team and the project. Serves as a central figure for team development. You know, the same thing about project success. It's really about making sure the team is developing. Understand that there's going to be a lot of conflict on teams. It's a positive step towards <coughs> becoming high performing. Keep an eye towards ethics. Take time to reflect on the project and make sure. key things uh, with Scrum Master that I try to focus on. They're a coach of the team members, they manage conflict, they facilitate decision making, they remove impediments, and they increase the organizational awareness of Scrum Master. So at least 28 people heard my point of view last week. And I told them that you'd hear my point of view as well, so they're all happy. Everyone always wants to know that everyone else is being trained. Next, we need to get all the team members in the room and have them understand their Product owner establishes the product vision, analyzes customer requirements, articulates some of his user stories, rates and prioritizes the product backlog, shows business value realization, and ultimately accepts the end product. Product owner does not interrupt the sprints, does not write lengthy requirement documents, and does not ultimately have to be full time in that team. Just one of with that, right? Yeah. The, interrupt sprints, what would be an example of interrupting a sprint? We'll talk about okay. that a couple of times, but essentially is sprints should never be started or stopped unless there's a particular thing that happens. And the thing that happens to uh, interrupt a sprint was the goal of the sprint is no, can no longer be realized. Either the customer that you're building it for no longer wants it, some the technology has changed, some organizational thing has changed. The, and if that's the case, the product owner cancel or terminate a sprint. But otherwise, they should not be starting and stopping a sprint. In traditional waterfall, we would have um, all sorts of things interrupt the work. We have people waiting around for things to happen. The intent is you don't want to stop the development even working. You don't want to um, have any sort of downtime. So they should not be interrupting that way. Can they interject? Yes, they should be doing that. Product owner, it's a complicated role, right? You have to be the subject matter expert, and this is all as it relates to the team. You may not be the subject matter expert in reality, but you need to be able to represent these roles to the team. Understand the domain well enough to envision the product. You're the customer advocate, right? You have, whether the customer is an end user or the customer is an actual external customer, uh, the product owner has to advocate for them. You have an advocate for the business making sure that whoever's paying the bills is getting what they're expecting. They're a key communicator in communicating the vision and the intent. The development team's primary interface with the business, with the customer, is the product owner. And this is the, you know, what's different from Waterfall to Agile is the decision maker on what gets built is the product owner. It used to be IT would be given this set of business requirements, they would decide when and how things were built. The product owner role is generally filled by a single person supported by a collaborative team. So even though there may be a lot of people behind a product owner, that person is the face to develop the team so that the team doesn't have to interact with you know, five different people along uh, the course of the iteration of the Responsibilities within this life cycle again is to create and maintain that product backlog, organize the backlog into incremental releases. We're going to talk about release planning more so tomorrow. 
specify the acceptance criteria for stories, attend the daily scrum, be available to answer questions throughout the sprint, evaluate the product at the end of the sprint and add and remove stories towards the end of the sprint if there is either more capacity or less capacity. Verify the stories as being done. We'll go through all of these kind of in detail. Well, just from uh, last week's training, I uh, remember one of the scrum masters wanted to remind you to tell us that we're not coaches. So. You're not coaches. Um, I think, you know, in a self organized team, leaders, leaders emerge. The leaders can emerge from the team, they could be the product owner. It could be a team member that's really advocating it. It could be the scrum master. You are a unique model because you also have a coach in there who's trying to coach and make sure everyone is developing. But the coach's job is to be fostering that self organization. So, this is not specifically a scrum um, terminology, this is general agile terminology. But essentially, this is a recommendation, and like in the PMI exam, this is how they you know, test people. So, the product vision needs to be up, updated annually. Product owner may not be the one doing it, it may be you know, the chief executive, but they need to be reflecting that to the team. The roadmap should be updated as frequently as you need to, but no less than you know, a couple times a year. The release plan, you know, every few months you need to be updating that release plan. All of these can be updated every single iteration as more data. You know. The sprint plan, which is what you're building, is every couple weeks, if that's your iteration by the product owner and the team. The key part of the release plan and the sprint plan is that the team is involved with the product owners. The product owner elaborates this, that the product owner is keeping the team involved so they see the vision, they know what they're building, they understand how what they're building today ties into the bigger picture. That's a big part of Agile. When the team is just working on spec in front of them, they don't have the context to build the right stuff, they may not be able to anticipate reuse, they may not be architecting the solution property if they don't understand Daily, the individuals on the team you know, constantly uh, planning on the work that they're doing at that So, I mean, product management and agile is really around these five areas. It assumes that there's a product or a project, and that product has a vision and a roadmap. How many of you were in the product management world before you were product owners? Is that your path here? Or other organizations? Some organizations, this concept of product management has been around for a while. So the shift to product owners was pretty seamless. Other organizations, this didn't exist. You know, the concept of the BA was the closest thing to a product owner a lot of organizations had. But this training as in product management has always been kind of elusive, as was the first time they formalized the concept of training. Each release is addressed around what can we deliver incrementally and iteratively, what's the business objective of each release, what general capabilities, and that's when we talk about the concept of epics. Epics help tell that story, the very large um, user stories, and ultimately you need to be able to create a lease plan. Within each generation or sprint, you know, what will we specifically build? How does iteration get us towards the release objectives? And then there's an iteration and sprint plan. And then each story needs to be very clear on how it's going to serve the stakeholder, how it will behave, how will I know when it's done. So these are all the product management pieces of an Agile project. So the product owner, top five things, again, this is kind of my take on it. They need to be able to create, create and maintain that product backlog, represent the customer in Scrum events. The Scrum events are all those um, sprint or iteration meetings. Show the teams adapting to change because this you're responsible for introducing change. You may tell them a release that's three months out and they may be all moving down that path, but you need to have them understand that I could change this direction completely each iteration. You inspect product progress and ultimately accept or reject work. 
any problems with these core five? Development team, perfect model is it consists of six plus or minus three people, so anywhere from three to nine people seems to be the sweet spot. I have some efforts to show that. You create the software, you self-organize, they estimate the user stories, they commit to the work that they're going to accomplish each iteration, and they develop skills outside of their expertise. What they don't do, they don't stop working when they encounter a roadblock. That's new to them. Typically, if you were a developer and the environment was down, you just take the rest of the afternoon off. Right? In Scrum, the expectations that you're going to try to find, can I go help someone else? Can I do backlog grooming? Can I help out the way? What can I do? And they don't increase technical debt. We'll talk a lot about that tomorrow. Are you doing this training for the development team, too? I'm not. That's what I was saying earlier. I said, train the Scrum masters, training product owners. The development team, the Scrum masters, are ultimately responsible for bringing this information back to the development team or in this model like getting coaches. I, just, I mean team training, when I roll out in a new company, I do a scrum master training, I do a product owner training, and then I do team training. I actually start with an executive training. Because everybody needs to know. Most people say, do the executives know this? No. Ultimately team members do need to know their role. It's a one day training where your team members know, understanding that. And some of the next stuff we're going to talk about is key for teams to understand the conflict management. Again, self-organize and recommend to the Scrum Masters that we do spend some time, even if they take some slides from this deck and ask the coach or the Scrum Master to walk through the expectations of the team. And, you know, we were trying to do that through suggestion that we use the Scrum Master checklist and doing all that stuff, and these things just... I'm available for Scrum Team training anytime. Um, you know, Scrum Team training is fun, especially because this is so new to them. The developers don't get training on management techniques. And they just don't come out of that background. They come out of engineering. You know, I was came out of engineering. I didn't know anything about it. I interacted with people. I didn't even know how to write. We had one class in five years of engineering, which was uh, English for engineers. And it was diagramming sentences, literally. It was like fourth grade English. So we don't learn anything as engineers, uh, especially system engineers. It wasn't until I went to grad school that I learned that this is a whole world. And you became a project manager. Developers are like that. They eat this stuff up because they've never been exposed to this concept of. So our lack of training for the dev team. So our lack of training for dev team is not unique just to State Street, but the other agile teams actually start doing this more. Is this that there's a need for it? But um, I should say it's it is kind of unique because those of you start with the development. Usually the Scrum masters go externally, um, but Scrum teams are the team. They're the ones doing the work, so they're the ones that are always. Typically, you guys are massive. This is a massive role, even in the industry, to roll out this much, you know, this many teams simultaneously. I've never taught this many product donors from one company. You know, I've always had product donors from, you know, there's 15 people in my class, it's usually 12 companies. Product donors. So you guys are a unique model that way. And I think a lot of team members have been to Jason's training. Um, but again, that's a holistic kind of high level. It's not specific to the for teams. So don't look at your book. This is a little exercise that I found this study uh, after Ken Schwaber talked about this company, PSMA, they're actually based in Massachusetts where they do uh, code productivity studies. So this is a study of thousands and thousands of uh, different projects, since it doesn't probably hundreds and hundreds of projects where they took a look and normalized um, development over lines of code. So this is a 75,000 line, uh, 75,000 line project average for uh, lines of code. They found that six people could complete this project in 13.6 months with a cost of 400 plus thousand. So if I increased this team size by three people, so that's a 50% increase, what should, how fast should this be done? By a third faster, probably. So it should be a third faster, right? So that would be like, take four off that, or nine something. You saw about a 10%. Instead of a 33% increase, you saw about a 10% improvement, which isn't horrible, but 
you know, and almost, again, cost-wise, it's 50% more expensive than you had in this. So that's not fast enough for me as a product owner. I want it faster. So can you guys double your team size? I said, no, I can double, we're going to have four teams. We'll get it twice as fast, right? Eh, a little bit faster, get another month off. Still not good enough. I really need this thing faster, so throw more people at it. So I'm going to do four times as many people. Ten months, still. How about five times as many people? Nine months. All right, how about 11 times as many people? And I get my half, get it in half. You can see that there's a total disparity by throwing uh, people at the process. That's why they found somewhere between three and nine is the sweet spot for the money you're spending, the amount of people, just because the coordination, the inefficiency. I've been on projects, uh, peripheral to projects, with hundreds of developers. I was at McKesson. They had 800 developers in one point working on the project. Hundreds of millions of dollars being burned through. The product never went live. Because the concept of coordinating, these are waterfall projects, coordinating all that code, all that development, all that integration, is just mind blowing. Has this been shared? <laughs> well, this is, you know, this is huge, and this is one of the reasons why waterfall has failed in so many massive implementations, because the mobile energy program is so inefficient. So it's just facts. You know, it's kind of so, so what is the right, the, the right thing for, from a, like, I get the whole productivity thing. You get into a, any project this size, and immediately you get into the middle, like, we're going to do this faster, right? So what they do is they throw people at it, right? Well, rather, than, rather than saying, looking at the statistics on the team or the metrics on the team and say, well, I, I'm at 50% capacity on this team. Help me get to 75% and I'm adding 25% without adding any people, right? Well, the way is to break is to make some more teams, not add more people to the same teams. So, so split, yeah. seed and split, right? So I know there are some agile teams right now that have 30 people on them. Yeah. Those should be three teams. Yeah. So that all the time. And I, think, you know, I think they're going to get there. I know the expectation states are going to add more and more and more and more teams. It becomes a coordination and everything else just across those teams as well. But you're going to see highly productive individual pieces of work. That becomes a lot more work for the product owners because you're now coordinating product releases. Right. So that's where the pendulum is going to Flip, and you guys have got to be the bottleneck. Can you be creating a pipeline to be lining up all these teams? I'm already saying it, gold time. You know, this, this offshore, onshore, you know, having a roadmap and a pipeline that's going to feed all these teams, and the product owner is going to become a bottleneck. So it's nice to be where you're at right now, but eventually, as the development teams actually get more productive, the product owner model is going to have to be very mature to keep up with them, feed it. You'll have your own type of status reporting that's going to be just unique to product owners um, visiting this and seeing where you're going and has a you know, very efficient pipeline so that there's that master backlog, there's product backlog, there's yeah. sprint backlog, so that everybody knows where to pull. Yeah. You know, it's going to be you know, pretty dramatic. You guys will probably be bleeding edge in the industry. No one's going to come in and tell you the right way to do it. You're probably going to be creating stuff. You should be doing some white papers on this um, you know, when you figure this out because you're going to get some interest in the industry. The whole industry is trying to figure out how to scale. As they're figuring out on the scrum master and the team size, I think the product owner side is um, totally uncharted territory. How do you manage that without creating a, your own bureaucracy on Agile? There's many waterfall requirements. Cool. So, self organizing teams have their own challenges as well. It's the most unique concept within Agile. It's often the biggest change. Why do you think this is often the biggest change having a self-organizing team? Why do you think it's often the biggest change out of everything we talked about, this concept of a self-organizing team? Everybody's always waiting for something else to tell them. People, I mean, look at State Street. How many levels of hierarchy are there within State Street from the entry level to the president? Too many. Too many. Yeah. Well, I know when I was at McKesson, I was an AVP, so I think there was I was five levels up from the most junior person on my team. I was seven levels down from the CEO of the whole company. There's 12 levels, and so everybody knows their place in these big organizations. I, I report 
this person is supposed to report to that person. Now you're thrown in a model where you have as much power as the person who's been sitting next to you as rather than someone. That's hard. People are not trained properly for that. They're expecting to be told what to do. People who are used to telling people what to do can't do that. So the concept of the self organizing team is often the biggest change. It's full of scrum butts. That just means a term in the industry. Is I do scrum, but you know, I don't do this. Or I do scrum, but I don't have a product on a roll. I do scrum, but I don't meet every day. Organizing, self-organizing teams say, yeah, I do Scrum, but I have development and QA as separate roles. Right? That's a state street Scrum, but. Existing problems are often highlighted or exacerbated. So one of the cool things about Scrum is the self-organizing team because it creates an opportunity for people to be managed by their peers. So if you haven't been on a Agile team, haven't seen this dynamic yet, it becomes very clear when somebody is underperforming. Why? Why is this different with that? Why would someone underperforming stand out sooner in that? So the transparency, like just how much they're contributing to like even daily stand up. Yeah, the daily stand up is huge, right? If you're not working on a story and you can't show progress in these two week iterations that are chunked up, and all of a sudden it's become very apparent if someone's an underperforming. People self-organize themselves right out of teams. You don't have to fire people in Agile. It's amazing. I was a dev manager for the last couple of years before I came to State Street. And my team, I was given them at the beginning, and I said to you know, the person who hired me, I said, how many of these people are keepers? And I don't know. I know there's a couple people that we have to find some way to get rid of. They've been here forever. They're total dead weight. You know, this was my dev manager. You know, they were telling me as a dev manager, I had to fire these people. I didn't have to fire anyone because I implemented ads and they weren't an agile shop, they were a waterfall shop. There's one woman on the team, she's a data analyst. She'd been there for 12 years. She'd been a data analyst for 12 years. This is a small company. She had a little bit of knowledge of everything in the, in every system in the company. People said, well, we can't really fire her. We don't know what she knows. You know, there's this fear of, she's not really an end performer. It's just hard to know what she's really doing. Put on an agile team gave her you know, um, a role within uh, one of the data threads, and she started being super productive because her work was visible. So she you know, rose to the challenge of Agile, which is to make her highly productive. But the reality was she hated being that productive. She actually had to work every day. She couldn't just mail it in. So she lasted about three months. I was patting her on the back as a boss saying, you're amazing, you're doing all this work. The team loves how productive you are. She quit. She'd been there 12 years. She advised, survived seven CIOs. You know, this woman could survive any sort of change in the world because she was um, totally averse from leaving that job. It was a nice, cushy job. But Agile made her quit. She was one of my boss. Wanted to be a fighter. What happens for a team member that doesn't rise to the challenge, that continues just to stay not really doing much? They will like either quit. Or you have so much empirical data that you get to just tell their functional manager and say, hey, this person is, yeah, they're not contributing to the team. Oftentimes what happens is other team members will go to that functional manager and say, this person's just not carrying their weight. So you don't have to, the functional manager is not in this position where they have to, you know, try to go out and gather data because the data is all there. You know, this person is committing to stories, not getting done, and it's in such small increments try to improve their performance. So if there's an existing problem, it's usually exacerbated and present very immediately. You may see this even in your own ranks. If someone has been mailing it in, you know, there's an opportunity now that they're being expected to deliver every two weeks even as a product. The flip side is too, people who are kind of those quiet, people you're really not sure on their productivity, are they a good member, they rise. You see those leaders come from within. It doesn't mean they have to be out there speaking. But they're delivering, people are going to them for help. You know, it becomes a great dynamic. And that's the part that I really love about Agile, is I've had more people thank me, you know, for introducing Agile than any other process I ever would have done. No one ever said, gee, thanks for rolling out project management. You know, I'm so much happier now. Being self-organizing, having the ability to be productive, manage your own time. You know, Ken Schwaber says it great. It almost puts tears in my eyes when you get so passionate about this. Was, we ask people to make it to work without being told what to do balance their checkbook, pay their mortgage. We ask them to do all these things, yet when they come to work, we manage them in 15-minute increments. You know, 
the software world, we've had project plans where we measure people down to the minute of their work that they used to do. Now in Agile, it's, just, it's out there, people are productive, they're more happy, and we're trusting people to be individuals. It's the cool part of Agile for me. If you have individuals that aren't doing things that stand up with their quiet, is that the Scrum Master's role to, to call them out, or is that a team? It's a team. The Scrum Master is never, ever to call anyone out. They can't be seen as that type of command and control manager. If an individual is not reporting on a user story, then being quiet is going to become embarrassing. Because people are all talking about the user story. So if they're constantly saying nothing about the user story, and that's why... But that's... That, and sorry to interrupt, but you would think that that would become embarrassing, right? <laughs> you just kind of skip over. I don't know how many weeks it takes to become embarrassing. Some right. people are not. Every they, day. They'll just come in and just stand there. And I don't know if it's the culture that we have at Stage Tree or it's just the change. I guarantee if we let somebody come in there, they'll stand there for years. If they're supposed to have work and they're not speaking, one it becomes a terrible data to bring to the function manager. If they're in the room and they don't have work, they need to stand outside. People are clear. The people in the scrum, even the scrum master, should, unless they're doing work, should not be standing in the circle. They should be standing outside the circle because the daily scrum is between the people doing work. So it's very clear who's doing work and who's not doing work. If you're standing outside, that person is going to feel, I mean, they'll ride it out for a while, but there's one that's going to be data if you're trying to do performance improvement, two, they become very uncomfortable. They, you know, well, what happens at State Street is, is that they'll go to their desk, they'll stop attending stand up, but they'll continue to, to book the A track. So that becomes a separate issue. But again, the process makes that much more visible. In Waterfall, you would never know that person because they had their queue. Yeah. You know, they'd be gone for six months, and like, what that person does, they must be working on something. <laughs> you know, they're in their queue. Now, at least, it's very clear to everyone. And the dynamic becomes uncomfortable. You know, if you think it's not uncomfortable for them, You'd be surprised. You know, they're looking. They may not have the skills to get the new job that they think they're qualified for, but they're looking on, there, um, on these projects. So, have you ever been on a high-performing team? And if so, what were some of the actions? Any type of high-performing team: sports team that seemed to win everything, work team, project team. being on a high performing team. Relationships between team members. Strong leaders. Strong leaders within a team. And understanding what their roles are. Clear understanding of role. Mutual respect. Trust. Essentially, all the agile principles. <laughs> <laughs> I guess the skills to complete the goal or objective. Yeah, they have the skills, right? Yeah, that's pretty much it. You know, you're committed to the team purpose and goals. Concept of we. How many people saw the World Cup yesterday? I guess last night. USA, did you know USA was playing last night? It's huge. America's all of a sudden become soccer fans. Did you see the news? It looks like they show it looks like we're in Ireland now. There was some thing, everyone's jumping up and down. They didn't do that at Super Bowl. You know, so we were I was at a happened to be a bar last night the game was on. but you know, this concept of being a high performing team is prevalent in our culture. Everybody knows what it is and it's sad that it's not in our workplace all the time. If you're on a high performing animal team, you kinda of get that same type of vibe. If you don't have purpose and goals, no group will become a team. And clarity of your goals is key. Understanding how you fit on that team is key. So I want to go over the concept of how teams develop because you are, as members of this team, need to understand that there are normal ways for the team to evolve, especially if you're on a brand new team, for people to understand that it's going to be a, kind of a growth of the team as a unit makes it more, I guess, tolerable to go through some of the harder parts when you start a new team. So 
So this is a team, this is a Tuckman's model for how teams develop. It's not specific to Agile, it's specific to how teams, it's any sort of team, sport, sport team, work team, what have you. So it's forming, storming, norming, performing. Pretty easy to remember. Forming teams are brand new teams. People are excited, enthusiasm's high. Everybody initially kind of has expectations and knows what their roles are going to be. You're initially relying on that leader of the team, that external leader. And all they're really concerned about is, you know, am I going to be okay with this new team? Are people going to trust me and people can accept me. So everything's kind of positive when a team starts. It's called the form. Very quickly for some teams or for some individuals, they get into what's called storming. You may have been on this part in your team and, and realize that, oh yeah, we went through that. What you thought was going to happen, <clears throat> and the reality hits you. I thought Agile was all about having a ping pong table and candy in the Agile. Now, I didn't realize I'd have to work harder than I've ever worked before in my life. That could be a stark reality. Uh, you know, it could be a negative reaction to each other. People are like, oh, She's a brown nose. She's trying to do this just so that she can get ahead. And, you know, subgroups may polarize the team. Trust is lowered. There's a breakdown in communication. Because everyone's trying to figure out where they fit, how's this organizational model work, there's power issues, there's control and conflict issues. So some organizations, <coughs> some teams get stuck here for a little while. It's good about Agile with these iterations because you're not stuck in a particular process for months and months where you, you then get stuck in forming, um, you begin to norm after multiple iterations. So as issues are addressed, you know, the things you were worried about, you're seeing products getting built, you're seeing happy product owners if you're a development team, you're seeing enthusiastic team members if you're a product owner or a scrum master, you're seeing these things um, start to work, productivity and technical skills will increase, you see, I've run retrospectives recently where people are literally ecstatic, close to euphoric at the end of a two-week sprint. And like, we do fist to five in the retrospectives that I coach on. So how did the iteration go, go for you? Lousy to awesome, right? The last one I did was everybody either had a four or a five. I mean, that's pretty cool to be able to say about work. Very few people feel that good about work in general. Yet the team was all smiling, the body language is great. I could totally see that there was really a sense of pride and pleasure on them delivering their work. It's just, it's just a great dynamic. You don't see that in big waterfall projects. You just don't. People are burnt. Trust and cohesion grows as you begin norming. There's more clarity and commitment to the purpose. You, know, you can bring people onto the team more easily. And the issues here are around sharing control, trying to avoid conflict. People are so afraid of conflict a little bit at this point that they're, you know, afraid to confront. And ultimately the goal, and some of the teams here may be at this level now, is they're performing, constantly being a high performing team. Enthusiasm's high, the skills are being increased, everyone's excited to be part of that team, they get really, um, uh, they're, good, they're really well aligned with the team, they say, yeah, I'm part of the gold copy team, or I'm part of the senior five team, you know, they get excited to say they're part of that team. A lot of clarity, it's a lot of mutual respect, communication is open, leadership is shared among the team, it's not no longer coming from the outside. And the issues really include you know, continuous improvement. So this is how teams form. Do any of you feel like you're in performing teams at this point? So you're a performing team. Does it feel like it to all the team members, they realize they're part of that? I think so. storming team right now with the team's crashing. Ben, do you remember when your team went through that? Is it possible for teams to get to the performing stage and then I don't know, maybe changes in the staff or whatever, you have to kind of go back into the process again? Anytime you get a new team member, the team will quickly potentially go through this whole cycle again. 
quickly. You have to norm to the new team member. If it's high performing, it should get back there quickly. If they're norming and they, the team member, or even you as product owner, you introduce some big technological change, control the whole team back as well because people may have to learn new skills, level of trust. Again, and you're part of this team because their ability to trust you and vice versa. Until you're trusting the team to deliver and they're trusting you to uh, have their best interests, you know, you're never going to be performing. I think a lot of teams have worked on it are close to performing. I think uh, there are things in the organization that are preventing them from really being self-organizing, and that's what's really slowing them down a little bit. This so they're norming right now and want to perform until they get through some of those roadblocks. That they get. Are these like in order? Like you should be forming, then storming. This is a, it's a sequence. Some of them may be quick. Some of them may be long. Just the form, you know, this could be go over months. These could be over hours. Like if you're if you're still in like a, like say for a team that's been together for a year and you're still forming, there's the wrong mix of people. There's the there's a, obviously things are missing. Yeah, there's not clarity of goals. There's not clarity of roles. There's key points missing. So it needs some sort of um, overall retrospective to say with the team. Part of that's good. It's why they need to understand that this is the opportunity. You know train them on, this is where the team needs to go. Training the team on conflict management, how teams develop. I think it's key for teams to know that there is a life as a team. It has its kind of own, it's its own organism that kind of evolves. You know, if I'm a scrum master on an underperforming team for a year, I'm losing my mind. You know, literally, I'm losing my mind. It's really, you know, product owners probably losing their mind, everyone's probably losing their mind. People could be quitting, you know, there's going to be some, a lot of, a lot of signs of it. So the benefits, this is why Agile promotes it, creativity and problem solving are high on self-organizing teams. Typically, you know, a developer is an artist. They perform at a higher level if given the opportunity to create. In Waterfall, when we hand them a prescriptive set of requirements, they're only going to build what you tell them. Side of their mind. And Agile, we're creating that initial conversation so they use that creative side of their mind. If you're in an IT organization, the people that are in bands, there's always a guitarist somewhere in the development team. You know, those are creative people. I worked with a um, senior manager who was a violinist, and the only way she could make money was to become a developer because she liked to constantly be an analyst and a coder. And so a lot of these um, developers have very creative minds and they need to um, give them the opportunity. Has there been any studies around the, the developer being in-house versus contractor? Um, there's plenty of plenty of case studies of that, that that doesn't matter. It's all okay. about it's all about that team. And what's interesting here, and I do see it, um, I've not been in as many teams as I have here where I've seen a developer, employee, what have you, and seen that homogeneous model. I see it. Working fine. You know, I would have been skeptical in my past to see how it's worked. You know, the, the contract has to support that and the model has to support that. If different people have different goals, you know, that's not going to work. But if the contract is just the TNM person versus employee, the goals are the same. It's when they have separate goals and separate metrics. Uh, the last company I was at, the vendors all were bonused off of overtime. Billables and things like that. You can see that would create a disparity working against to an employee who's definitely not, we're not bonus them for it. Maybe acknowledge, but we're not bonus. So the benefits of self organizing team, you know, change is much quicker. Productivity and quality is seen to be uh, significantly higher. Um, these studies, Jeff Sutherland is big into the productivity studies around self organizing teams. His goal is to bring major multipliers by introducing agile and scrum. So if a team can do, you know, 10 lines of code in a day, once they self-organize and do this, they can do 70 lines of code. They see some orders of magnitude increase in productivity of self-organizing teams. There's fewer meetings, odds of burnout are less, and leadership among peers. You'll see leaders arise in agile teams right from
So we talked about this on the Agile Manifesto, but you know, face-to-face -face communication is a key part of Agile. One of the reasons is this term osmotic communication, which I'll talk about. We'll talk a little bit about how this works with the student teams. So, you know, the most efficient and effective method of conveying information to and within the development team is face-to-face. Co-located teams benefit uh, from this type of communication, which is obviously key in a lot of the actual teams here at Stage 2. The user story creation with the team members is highly desirable and providing feedback during the sprint face-to-face. So Stacey has done a good job of creating agile rooms and agile spaces where people literally turning around, you know, talking about the work, uh, creating that environment where a lot of communication uh, can occur. And now the piece of this is the face-to-face -face communication is a lot going on other than the words. Uh, I'm not sure if you've been in meetings where, you know, you hear something on the phone, you think someone's bought in, and come to find out you realize that person was not really didn't have the nonverbals. You know, out of this study is, what is it, 92% of the information I'm getting from the interaction is from the nonverbals. You know, when I'm in a class and someone's snoozing and they've got their arms like this, that's, a, that's giving me a lot of data. I don't need them to say much for you to understand you know, how the energy in the room is. You know, if someone's nodding or agreeing or smiling, that's one piece of information versus a frown or a concern. So face-to-face -face communication addresses a lot of communication, or adds a lot to the communication. Osmotic communication, this is this term basically that says if you're working in an environment and people are interacting around you verbally, you're going to hear it. It's going to go in and you're going to process it to some level. You may then contribute to that or you may remember it for later on. So this is one of the key parts of Azo. It's actually it's not an agile term, but it's on a lot of the exams, this concept of osmotic communication. You'll see it in the agile room. You'll see people working. You'll see someone hear something and jump in and say, oh, yeah, yeah, I just fixed that. Or you're telling someone that the environment's down. It's all happening very organically and very quickly. It cuts down significantly. I know when I mentioned this to the Scrum Masters, we went through these slides, they said, oh, yeah, the number of emails that we get now is so much less now than on agile because everyone's not just sending out an email every two seconds. I know I've been in meetings, I'm sorry, I've been in organizations where people are emailing and the person in the next cubicle. Mm -hmm. You know, that wall becomes a office barrier. And that was kind of the culture. It's like in your cube, that's a quiet zone. You can't talk over the cubes, get an email. Um, obviously, that's all torn down with the open space design. Um, this is nothing new to you guys. When I present this sometimes to companies that don't do this, this is their biggest shocker about all, all agile. I'm going to be in an open space, I can't have my cube. McKesson, they used to measure the cubes based on the level. It's like if this person ended up with a bigger cube and they were at a lower level, they would be held to pay for facilities. How come they have a 20 square foot when I have a 19 square foot? Um, so open space is very radical for some organizations. State Street has embraced this up front. They didn't have, you know, they allowed the out of possible and said this is going to work out. Um, it's not a big scrum button here for that. Uh, but it's still an issue and there are challenges with open space design. Do you guys have norms for your open space model on any of your teams? Is anything acceptable? Is there any rules around the open space model on any of your teams? Okay. Open space can be challenging, right? Because people are doing personal calls or they're running conference calls and it's not related to the work of the team. The whole point of osmotic communication is now to come to date. I said that wrong with the driving bullets that if you have a conference call that not everyone's part of them, there's someone else. But the limited conference rooms available because yeah. there are so many teams, it's, it makes it so difficult to do that. Breakout space is really, really difficult. But so that's, you know, that's the challenge of the open space that it can become a distraction. So you define ways, self-organized with the team, it may be that, you know, some of the dev managers or other managers are giving up their office for people to use for conferences. And <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was at a company not that long ago, the entire company was open space. CEO, everybody sat at tables. You know, it has to be a cultural uh, dynamic. I think it's great that the product owners sit next to the development team. That's not common. The development team and scrum master can tend to be open space. Having that product owner there, a lot of product does that. Ah, I don't work in IT. I'm not going to go sit there. So that's become a, uh, a little bit of a challenge in open space design. Seeing that you guys do that, half of the interaction in that open space is being the product owner when they're uh, centrally located. Model and a great implementation here. To 
distributed genes are very common, they are more challenging, so we need to take advantage of you know, whatever technology we have, email, messaging, video conferencing, collaboration tools, you guys have Collaborate, you have RTC, those are all tools that can support working with distributed teams. Um, but the commitment you need to make, you know, both as a product owner or any other team member, is the more informal communication. You have every interaction with the team that you work with being that formal one, you're not going to build that relationship, you're not going to, you're going to have that level of trust. So, you know, reach out to someone if you know it's their birthday. Check in after the weekend if someone's working on something before you just ask them about the task. You know, how was your weekend? Even if they're in China, they're going to uh, be able to answer you that question. You know, if you ask them a technical question, you jump right into that, you're creating that uh, kind of report to, even as a product owner. So commit to this. I know it's hard. We're all task oriented, especially when we're trying to get people on the phone uh, or work with these teams. But informal communication is a key part of working with distributed teams. I work in companies that have uh, the video conferencing where there's a table right up to the screen, and the other side is the other side of the table, and you can see everybody. You know, like they're sitting at a table, and you can see the body language. Another client I was at not that long ago, they used. The Google Hangout, have you guys seen that? Yeah. It's free, right? You bring up your laptop, you bring up Google Hangout, and everybody as they talk, their face pops up on the screen. Tremendously valuable compared to a regular conference call. I don't know if we'll get through the state street firewall. Exactly, it won't. Uh, but if you <laughs> made that as a recommendation and became a groundswell, I mean, it's just opening up a port to a particular thing. It's a bandwidth issue, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, again, around productivity, especially if you pilot it with Offshore team, there is a lot of that. It's huge getting that face to face interaction. All right. Try to do the social, to your point, the social media support. To keep it going, the report to me. Keep it going for more. Because otherwise, it incentivizes stuff carries into the stand up, which takes away from the stand up purposes. Right. Yeah, you want to keep this, the stand up. Becomes all of a sudden a dumping ground for all sorts of interactions. What happens more when we have distributed teams from what I can say? Did you what did you say again, sir? It's a WeChat. Oh, okay. It's a Chinese speech. You didn't have any firewall issues with that? I, I do it on my personal. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Have you asked, like, if you could internally get it? Or? No, because I mean, it's, it's it, like I said, it's not like I do still use my Blackbird for communications, but at least I keep. Um, that one that I have with the team that I bought when I was there. That's the sad part, right? Is you should, we shouldn't have to do it outside of State Street. But again, you guys are, you know, the whole State Street is ahead, right? It's, it's, it's teams, so you have to. And even though there's 30 teams, that's still a s tiny subset of the overall number of teams that are expected to have. They want ultimately 300 or 600 teams to raise them out. So you are in the pilot mode, you have to try things out, you know, try to get permission open to buy a wall or something. It's all possible. People assume things are impossible. I'm just curious about the other teams. Um, how many of you guys have team members that work from home or work in different locations, like certain days of the week, and how do they manage? I, I think from our perspective, we have teams, and I'll let Dale and the other product owners. I know that one team that they have uh, every two weeks, they work from home on a Friday. Which is, I think, has been effective. On the the team. whole team does it. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And it's not mandatory, right? If yeah. people want to come yeah. into the office, they can come into the office. Um, I think it works better at the like, mid iteration rather than at the beginning where we're doing a lot of planning on what we have a lot of meetings. So, demos, yeah. yeah, exactly. So um, that works. And then they, they use OCS a lot um, for the most part. And I know they have a uh, conference call, so they'll open up the line and they have conference calls during those days. Other than that, like, um, we've had team members in, in China. And the time difference, it, it just created such a, a problem for our teams to communicate effectively. I think it made it so that a lot of things were done via email. It took away a lot because those members of the team were here for two months, and then they went back, and it, it, the dynamic was very different from when they were here. So. I think RTC plays a big, a big part of that, right? If you have the your everything up on RTC, including your tasks, and uh, stories, and backlog, and everything, then it creates that transparency, which is better. but. I think that for the first one that I'm actually seeing, we distributed in LA, and so we 
but it's the fact that I'm using IGC to, to express what we're and everything. So I think that's part of the reason why I think that worked out well for us. But it, that, it, I'd like to revisit that at some point. Our staff is used to working from home or working in a different location, and now we get everybody to work together every single day. So I'm just trying to figure out how to yeah. make that work. It's a big change for some people. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, I think that you know we talk about the daily scrum and other things have to be mandatory. Let's do the last section of the Scrum framework, which is the meeting, ceremony, and events. And the Scrum Guide is they're called events. There's terminology in the industry out there. There's Scrum ceremonies, basically all the meetings that go on in an iteration. They're all time boxed, so Scrum is very specific about how long things should last at a maximum. So sprints should be no longer than four weeks. States should become very typical now. I've seen most companies I work with around two weeks uh, because a month even begins to feel pretty long. When you go from waterfall, you know, a month seems fast. Then when all of a sudden you're doing this for a month, the product owners are like, no, no, I want things sooner. A month feels too long. So most organizations have shrunk that down. Sometimes the process overhead makes it so that um, the sprints need to be longer. Sprint planning, it's one hour per week of sprint based on to do requirements, one hour per week of sprint. Design. We'll talk about that. Sprint review. Similarly, one hour per week of spent with one hour prep. Sprint retrospectives, three hours. Daily scrum, 15 minutes. Backlog of time, two hours per week. So go through Why do we time box without looking at the page? <laughs> Why do you think this is important to do time box? And this is a unique, unique thing with that. Right? It's, it's, it's getting to the work and not planning for the work. Right. So you, you, you're working, you only have so much time so you can't dilly-dally. If you're 